Father, once again, we are in your presence. And thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to worship your name. When I use the word worship your name, oh Father, I'm referring to not only the singing part or the praising part. I use the word worshiping you when I'm in, not in the church, when I use my word with my neighbors, how I use my word to my co-workers, how I treat people outside the ones that I love. Heavenly Father, what opportunity that we have to come before you this morning. It is kind of beautiful built outside, it's kind of beautiful outside, I know it's a mess, it's snowing, but oh Father, we, it reminds us that you are the creator of everything. And Father, it is snowing out there, but we are warm inside here, and I ask your presence, your Holy Spirit to be with every one of us at this moment. We had a preacher that she was supposed to be here at this very hour. But for some reason, you know all things, she's not here. I ask then, O oh Father, that your Holy Spirit can use me as you have been using me all the time. That my words of my mouth can be guided by you. And that at the end of this day, O oh Father, we, as we go home tomorrow, help us to act towards your gospel and share your message to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, what comes to your mind when you read that word, God? What comes to your mind when you, you are listening to the word and you see God? What comes to your mind when you, you see that word? What comes to your mind as a leader, as an Adventist people? What, what comes to your mind as a Y director, as a Pathfinder director, as a youth leader director? What comes to your mind when you see the word God? I guess that sometimes we are, we are so used to, to say that word God. We are so used to say that word that we take for granted what the meaning of God for every one of us. I, I wonder sometimes if you are not using the words, the word God, only when we are here at the church. I wonder if God is, is, is present to my life when I'm interacting with people, when I have people around me, when I, when I with my, ha my wife or husband, or when with my kids, how that word is for me, God. What the meaning of the word when you are a pathfinder leader or master guide leader or adventurer leader or AY leader and you have these kids in front of you and you have to teach them the word of God, you have to talk to them about God, what, what that means for you as a leader. Our emphasis here in this weekend is about leadership, our spiritual life before God because if I'm not okay with Him, I cannot be okay with others. What the meaning of God, for us to understand a little bit that word, I'd like to invite you to go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is, is a beautiful book, amen? amen. And sometimes we read, we, we read the book of Revelation and we don't get much. What's the meaning of this book? And this morning, I'm going to share with you rapidly five chapters of the book. Of course, I'm not going to, you know, myself want to give you an overview about that book, the book of Revelation. In the Bible, in the Bible's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 8, it says, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. And then it says, verse 8, I am the Alpha, and what? And the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. It is beautiful how God presents himself to John. It is beautiful how God comes to John, Jesus comes to John, and he says, John, listen, I am the, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 
It's good when God presents itself to us. When God comes to us, He says, I am your comforter. I am your rock. I am your salvation. I am your God. I am your strength. I am... And you fill in the, the blanks, whatever you need about this God. And God starts presenting Himself to John. And God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And then John, the Bible... The Bible tells, chapter 1, that Jesus Christ is revealing himself to John. He was in Patmos, alone, and he needed to hear that God was there with him. Sometimes in our lives we might be in an island. We might be passing through a difficult time, but we have to understand that God is always with us. Always God is there for us. Always we have the hand of the Lord upon us. In the chapter 1 of Revelation, Jesus is presenting himself to John. And then the Bible comes on chapter 1 and chapter 2. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, we are talking, the Bible is talking about the seven churches. Something that's happening here on earth. We understand as Seventh-day Adventist people, we understand the seven churches was a period of historical period throughout the ages of this earth. And now this, the seven churches, that is a message for every one of them. But then comes the end of chapter 3 of Revelation. In verse 21, it says this. To the one who is what? To the one who is what? Victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Amen? So here Jesus is presenting himself, the one who is what? Who is victorious. And I like that word, because the word victorious means that you have to fight about something. You cannot be a victorious if you don't fight. You cannot be a victorious if you don't have struggles in your life. You cannot be victorious if you don't face the challenge of your life and be victorious after that. And that's what Jesus is saying here. In the name of Jesus, we can be victorious. Amen? In the name of Jesus, we can stop lying. In the name of Jesus, we can stop gossiping. In the name of Jesus, we can stop smoking. In the name of Jesus, we can stop drinking. In the name of Jesus, we can love our wife today more than yesterday. In the name of Jesus, I can control my temper. In the name of Jesus, I can stop hating and start loving. In the name of Jesus, I can be a better today than I was yesterday. In the name of Jesus, I can be a pathfinder leader. In the name of Jesus, I can be an adventurer leader. In the name of Jesus, I can be a, gaster, a, a master guide. In the name of Jesus, I can be a victorious in his name. And this is what God, Jesus himself, he was presenting himself to John. He was saying, I am the victorious. And then he says, at the end he says, I will give the right. He says, I will give... To the victorious, I will give the right to sit with me. Where? In my throne. Can you picture that? This awesome God, the creator of everything. He said, you can sit with me in my throne. Don't you want to do that? Go in heaven. Because if you are going, if we are going to be there, and we are going to be there, amen, church? We are going to be in heaven, and we are going to be victorious in the name of Jesus. Not only that, we are going to have the right to sit beside Jesus Christ. So this is what we have in chapter 1, Jesus presenting himself. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 is the churches, and then this how ends chapter 3. And now we have in chapter 4, and that's my main focus this morning. It says, at once, I was in the Spirit. And there before me was what? A throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. 
a ray bomb that shone like an emerald encircled the, the, the throne. So here we have this idea that John, I mean this idea, no, this image, this vision, that John is saying, I saw someone in heaven. He didn't want to say the word God. He didn't, he didn't want to say the word Yahweh. And then he says, someone is there. But we know that the someone he's talking about, we know that he's talking about Jesus Christ. And he said, I saw someone there sitting on, it, on the throne. And John don't want to describe the Lord. And then he starting mentioning what he was seeing. And then he says, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Picture this with me. Chapter 1, Jesus Christ is presenting himself. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am with you. Chapter 2 and 3, Jesus is saying the whole church is through all the ages, I am with you. I am victorious and you can be victorious as well. And then come chapter 4. Chapter 4 is not something that's happening here on earth. Chapter 4 is something that's happening in heaven. And the Bible says that John, he saw the throne of God. Can you imagine that? The throne of God. This is what he's saying. The throne of God was there. And surrounding the throne of God, it had there 12 thrones for each side. 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones, he had there 24 elders. Picture this, people. The throne of God is there. 12 people on one side, 12 elders on one side, 12 elders on another side. And God is there sitting on the throne. And these 12 people, they are in front of the Lord. 12 thrones besides the Lord. And now comes the next, the next, the next Bible test that we see. In the center, around the throne were four living creatures. In the center, four living creatures. You have 12 thrones with 12 elders. The other side, 12 thrones with 12 elders. We have God sitting on his throne. And now you have four living creatures. The Bible describes how they look like. And these four li living creatures, this is what they are saying before the Lord. The Bible says this, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So this is what you, we are seeing this picture, these 12 uh, thrones and 24 elders, 12 in each side, 24 elders. And then we have these four living creatures. And the Bible says that the four living creatures, they don't stop singing day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they keep saying that holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. Day and night they keep singing holy, 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 our Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And now comes the next part. The Bible says that every time the four creatures singing, they says, the Bible says, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him, who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the thrones and say, You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their beings. So here now, I want you to understand what the Bible is saying there. They have these four, 24, 24 elders, one in each side. And when the, the four living creatures, they start proclaiming the name of God, they also, they bow down before God and they start singing and, 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 and mention the name of the Lord. The Lord our God, you are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their beings. So here is the reason they are worshiping the Lord. This is the reason they are proclaiming the name of God and the reason is God is your creator. You 
were not born by, you know, by randomly. You were born because God created you. Amen. Amen? Amen. The way you are. God created you the way you are. And that's the reason we serve the Lord. The reason we serve the Lord is not because you know how to do camping, pathfinders and master guides. The reason we serve the Lord is not because we know how to do some knots. The reason we serve the Lord is because He is my creator. The reason we serve the Lord is because in God's mind, I was supposed to be here. I am God's creation. The reason I worship the Lord because in God's mind, you are supposed to be here. And that's the reason we are worshiping God. Who are the 24 elders? You see this picture, God in his throne. You have 24 elders. They bow down and they are worshiping the Lord and saying, how good and how great is our God. Who are they? Our church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, we believe that those people that were singing and praising God were people that they resurrected with Jesus on the third day. The Bible says this. Why they believe that? First of all, because they are using white robes. Is meant to be a faithfulness. They have a crown of victory. There is two kinds of crowns in the Bible. The royal crown and the victor's crown. And they were using that crown, crown that's called Stephanus. They were representing 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples. That's why the number 24, 12 disciples and the 12 tribes of Israel. The Bible says at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tomb broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So here, my friends, we have the 24 elders. They are Jesus, let me say that, they are, allow me to say that, they are Jesus' trophies. When Jesus came to this earth, when he lived here, when he finally died on the cross, on the third day, the Bible says that the tombs were open and people raised. And we believe that those people are there worshiping God in heaven. Could you imagine Jesus Christ when he got these people with him and he went to heaven showing to the universe that it was good, that it was worthy to save the human race. It was like Jesus was saying for the whole universe, this I brought because I saved them and they belong to me. It's just a, a, you know, a glimpse what one day, you and me, we are going to walk with Jesus in the gates of heaven. That one day, we are going to be in heaven. God's going to say, you belong to me for all the eternity. So they are worshiping God in chapter 4. Because God is the creator of the world. Now we went in chapter 5. And it says... And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. Now John has another vision. 24 elders, that vision is gone. He comes on chapter 5, he has another vision. And he saw a scroll. And nobody could open the scroll. The next Bible verse you're going to see in your Bible, that the Bible says that John wept. He cried because no one were found worthy to open the scroll. And then the Bible says on verse 11, they looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering how many? Thousands upon thousands. And ten thousands times ten thousands. This is expression in the Bible to say you can't count. You can't count. It's too many people. It says 
they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Word is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped God. See, here, here we have another picture. Chapter 5, John is seeing the image again, the throne of God. Now, he's not only seeing the 12 tribes representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's not seeing only the 12 representative of the disciples. What he's seeing now is 10,000s, 10,000s, 10,000s. That means many, many, many people are worshiping the Lord. I don't know if I call them people, God's creature, people, pe pe creatures of God that were there worshiping God, angels of the Lord that they are in heaven worshiping God. Friends, picture this. And this is the amazing God we are worshiping. In heaven, they worship this Lord our God not because they want something from Him, but because they acknowledge how, God, how good, good God is. Let me explain this to you. Sometimes I hear people in the church saying to me, Pastor, thank God because God gave me a new job. Yeah, don't get me wrong. It's okay. But guess what? The pagan people out there, they also get a new car. They also get a new job. They also get a new clothes. What the people of the Lord must say I praise God when I have and when I don't have a job. I praise God when I have and when I don't have a car. I praise God when I have a problem and when I don't have a problem in my life. I praise God when I face difficulties and when I don't face difficulties. I praise God because I know this God, the creator of everything, He's there walking with me. And that's the reason they are worshiping the Lord. They are not worshiping the Lord and praying God and worshiping His name. He's saying, Lord, please help me to find another job. Oh God, please help me to find another car or job. God, please help me to find a friend. No, the reason they are worshiping God is because Jesus Christ came on this earth and He died for every one of us. The reason they are worshiping is because the Bible says the Lamb, the Word is the Lamb who was what? Who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The reason they are worshiping God now in chapter 5 is because God is our salvation. So, is our salvation. Amen? That's the reason they are worshiping the Lord. In chapter 4, they are worshiping God because it's God the Creator. And they are worshiping God. God, thank you because you created us. You created everything. We thank you for that. In chapter 5, they acknowledge that this God. They acknowledge that this wonderful God. They acknowledge that this powerful God. He left everything. He came here. They acknowledge that God is the Creator. He was not supposed to be here. He was not supposed to walk here on earth. He was not supposed to feel what we are feeling. He was not supposed to die on the cross. He was not supposed to do that. But they acknowledge that Jesus is the creator, the creator of all things. And then this God that is creator of all things, he said, I'm coming down. I'm coming down because I have my children there and I want to take them with me. And they are worshiping this God, not because they want something from Him, but because they acknowledge how good, how wonderful God is. When I started my sermon this morning, I did ask the question, when you see the word God, what comes to your mind? 
What comes to your mind when you see that word? And this is what the Bible presents to us. Word is the lamb who was slain and received power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. And the Bible says they heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's why when we are fighting about worship it has nothing to do about this. This is the reason we worship God. This is the reason we go before the Lord. We don't go before God because we're listening to this type of music. Listen, no, no. We go before God because He created me and I worship God because He died on the cross for me. That's the reason I worship God. And sometimes we, we, we have our mind, you know, or thinking the, the way we, we try to do church. This is what the Bible says. That's why you worship me. That's why you come in front of me because I created you and I die on the cross for you. How, how does this affect my life? That, that's the most important thing. Am I better today than I was yesterday? Am I, better, am I a better Christian today than I was yesterday? Am I a better father today than I was yesterday? Am I a better mother today than I was yesterday? Am I a better brother or sister today than I was yesterday? Am I a better member of the church today than I was yesterday? Because God died on the cross for us, for us to be victorious. The God died on the cross for us that we, through Him, we can be better creation. God said, the work I start in your life, I will complete it. I have to be, in the name of Jesus, I have to be better creation today than I was yesterday. In the name of Jesus, I have to follow God with all my heart because this is the reason we are following Him. This is the reason we are worshiping Him. This is the reason we are in God's presence and I got to be better Christian today than I was yesterday. I cannot be the same. I cannot worship this God and then come to church and sing to Him and pray to Him. And then when I go out of the church, I live my life the way I want. I listen to music the way I want. I, 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 I eat whatever I want. I, I watch whatever movies I want. And, and then I say, oh, then with the next Saturday, I come to church and I worship God. And the next week, I live my life the way I want. No, it's not supposed to be this. When I come to church, I have to bring God with me. Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, I don't feel God in the church today. You don't feel God in the church today because you left God somewhere else during the week. But when I spend my time with God during the week, when I kneel down before my Lord during the week, when I seek my God during the week, when I pray to Him, when I read His Bible, I come to church. It doesn't matter the preach, it doesn't matter the music. I know I am God's presence because God is with me during the week, not only 20 minutes in the church. And this is worshiping the Lord to be in His presence. But I got to change. One day, I left the, the Brazilian church, and it was Saturday night, and we had a block from the church. We have a, a Brazilian pizza, you know? It's Brazilian pizza is different than any other pizza. You know why? Because the name Brazilian pizza comes first. That, you know? So, and I, I, I was walking with my family, it was me, it was my youngest daughter, and it was my wife, and it was my oldest daughter. And we were walking, and then there is the, you know, the, the pedestrian line, you know, pedestrian line that you have to cross, and I, I start walking, and then there is this bus in front of me, and I couldn't see if the car was coming or not. And my oldest daughter, when she saw that I was starting walking, she'd run, and then a car was coming, Ooh, and the car hit her and she flipped on, on the hood of the car and then the drive braked and she threw her on the street. In these seconds, when I saw the car 
hitting my daughter. When I saw the car hitting my daughter, I put my hands on the car, you know, like, stop, stop. But I couldn't, of course. <laughs> I mean, I wish I was Superman or something. But I touched the car, and I saw the car hitting my daughter and, and all that stuff. Went to the doctor and everything, and she was, nothing happened, not a scratch on her. But I was thinking about it. I was thinking if someone would come to me and would say, instead, my daughter be hit by a car, could you put your daughter in the place of my daughter? I would say no. I wouldn't allow my daughter to be hit by a car for nobody else, for nobody. Are you following me? I wouldn't. You may say that I'm selfish, but if you have a daughter, I mean, you don't want her to suffer because of somebody else. You just don't. But then I was thinking about God. And I confess to you that when this happened, the driver, I moved my daughter from the front of the car, and then a few seconds later, the driver ran away. And when he runs away, I have a friend of mine. She had a car that I got her car, and I said, we're going to get this guy. And I drove two blocks, and then he told me, I said, what am I doing? Like God was asking me, what are you doing? And I said, Lord, I'm going to get this car. I'm going to smash his face, Lord. <laughs> That's what I want to do, Lord. And then I feel that relieved, God saying, it's okay. But anyway, I was. After all the ordeal happened, I was thinking about God. <laughs> Would I give my daughter for someone? No, I wouldn't. But God did. His only begotten Son for you and for me, God did. And what a, you know, what a wonderful God that He came from heaven with agreement with His Father. He said, yes, I'm going to walk on earth for 33 years. I'm going to show them the way. I'm going to walk the talk. I'm going to show them how to love. I'm going to show them how to be the salt of the world. I'm going to show them how it is to live a life like that. I'm going to show the way to heaven. What a, what a wonderful God. And then God came on earth and for 30 years, finally, three years of his ministry he was on that cross and some people were around him some people were accepting him some people were, were understanding that God himself was dying on the cross and then finally Jesus saw everybody around him and I believe God was Jesus was thinking his heart it was for you that I'm doing this. But 2,000 years later, we can still experience the cross. We can still see what God has done for us on Calvary. We can still see God smiling to us and saying, I have done this because I love you. Well, what, a, what a great God. And that's the reason we worship Him. That's the reason we kneel before God. And that's the reason you are a leader. That's the reason you are a master guide leader. That's the reason you are a pathfinder, adventurers, AY leaders. That's the only reason. 
The other day, we had a retreat with the, the team from the conference, and I said to the leaders, I don't know and I don't care what you know. The only thing that matters is how our life is before God. I don't care if you know how to do a hundred knots. I don't care if you know how to put your tent in two minutes. The only thing that is important if you are walking with God and He will teach you to do some knots. He will teach you to do camping. Because with God, you can be the better, the better one to do knots. With God, you can set your tent in seconds. But without God, you are not supposed to be a leader. You are not supposed to be a leader. The reason you are a leader is because God has a message to you that you have to share this message to others. And that's the reason we are worshiping God.